purposes. So I got a uh, Windows 10 machine, which I'll use now. You could do this on Windows 7 as well. There's no, there's no uh, difference in this case. And I have a domain controller as well, which currently I only need the Windows 10 box on. So let's just log on to this computer first. And what I've done is I got this built-in whitelisting running, which is called AppLocker in this case. And currently on this machine, AppLocker is, is actually on, but it's only auditing, which means that if I will, for example, try to download something, let's first of all, I want to show you that I'm not an admin. So if I try to start the command processor with admin rights, it'll ask me for username and password because I'm not an administrator, okay? So now I'm not an admin, so mostly I can't install software, so that's fine. But now for some years, uh, the most common ones being Firefox, uh, Spotify, Google Chrome, they've changed the way they install, uh, oh, sorry, and TeamViewer as well. So they changed the way they install, which means that now if I'm not an admin and I want to install Firefox, this starts to install Firefox and it asks me for admin rights. Now the weird thing, and the kind of funny thing in this Firefox installer is that if I just say that no, I'm not an admin, then it will install without. So that doesn't really take care of everything that I've already taken away my admin rights. I also have to somehow be able to control these things that might install on my machine even if I'm not an admin. So we can easily block this with an internal, even just a basic whitelisting of Windows. I could just go and say that AppLocker will from now on be in enforced mode. And I have a very simple rule set which just states that anything in this computer works so that you can run anything from program files folder, you can run anything from Windows folder, and admins can run anything anyway because AppLocker doesn't or any other whitelisting, they don't work against admins. So this rule is there just to make things a bit simpler because they will get those running anyway if they just want to. So these two are awesome. There's a bit small problem with this because Microsoft has made a, some faults in this, meaning that Windows folder, for example, has uh, some subfolders that you can write to even if you are a limit, uh, even if you're a limited user. So we have to add some exclusions to this. For example, um, Windows folder, there's the temp folder that you can't run things from, and there's a, a tracing folder that you can't run things from. You have to make sure that your program files is secure, meaning that there are no holes where normal limited users could write into it. But now let's say that I've already set program files so that you can't uh, copy anything there, and I've set Windows so that you can't copy anything there. I would be amazed if you know a way to run a malware on this machine. You can send me an email later or ask me after the session. I'm quite sure some of you will find a way, which means there are, for example, certain things that run DLL32 needs to be um, blocked with a firewall rule. You can hit me with this. I'm quite good in um, making sure those small holes are tweaked. Now the problem with the, if, if we see how this affects the computer itself, so this is now a whitelist that's operational. If I go for Firefox, well, that's blocked, okay? That's very easy. That's blocked by police now. But there's quite a lot of limitations on this. One of the first things that I don't like is the fact that AppLocker only has the, app, has the pos, uh, options of having allow or deny. So, for example, Firefox could be an example where I could be on this gray list, which would be that they would ask me that um, we noticed you tried to install an uh, unsupported browser. Is there a good reason for you to do it? Or some sort of a gray area between the, the full deny, full allow. It's also a bit hard when I start to do rules against this. So what if Firefox really needs to be able to run? So, so let's, let's just, um, for the fun of it, let's create a folder here. And that folder will be called Firefox. No, that's Firefox. I don't know. You, you, it's an unpublished application which I can't tell you anything about. So let's go here and now I'm going to move that Firefox to this folder here. And then I'm going to do a rule saying that let's create a rule next allow everyone to run 
with this path rule from C. Oops. Come on. Where's my keyboard? Let's do browse folders. Okay. So C Firefox, and it has to have the asterisk at the end. Okay. So now that would be a rule. Okay. So now we can run anything from Firefox. C Firefox, and we could just block that no one can write to it, and that would be cool. Okay. So now we get to another problem because now Firefox, although I allowed everything from here, actually extracts something to another location. So 7-zip extracts this first to a temp location and that temp location is not allowed. So what I could do is use publishers. I could like allow everything from Firefox. But then with Firefox, for example, we have a little bit trouble with the versioning, which version to allow and stuff like that. So although application whitelisting itself is mandatory, it is not the best possible one. And um, I can show you, for example, my own machine has a whitelist that only has one rule. And my whitelist says that, um, let me just actually, let me see, just give me a sec. Go back online. And now if you see mine, mine is just a super simple list. I luckily I run a vector on my machine as well, so I can I can then do a few tricks to make this even better, which you'll see later on. I'm not gonna showcase that. Um, here's my only rule. This is kind of like a pass-through rule, but this is kind of funny. I allow anything that's signed. Some of you might find it funny, but I trust myself quite a lot, so I believe I know how to work with security, but that one still kills 95% of all malware in the world. So out of that 300,000, I kill 95% every day by that simple rule. So I think it's still kind of cool to just let it flow through and then I can actually do a lot greater stuff with some other whitelists. Now, although whitelisting itself is um, as a concept, I hope you understand what's the difference between doing uh, reactive and proactive. Um, whitelisting has a little bit of drawbacks. One is very poor pinpointing, so I can't pinpoint, for example, allow this to run if we have a certain URL rule. So I can't use external uh, identification. I just have that executable or the signature. Uh, there's no gray listing, like I mentioned, and no messaging. And, of course, you have to get rid of admin rights first anyway. So that's the more important part than any whitelisting. Because you can do whitelisting, but if you have admin rights, that whitelisting won't really work. Um, there's no way of building a secure Windows endpoint nowadays with, without two measures. First of all, you have to have full disk encryption like BitLocker. If you don't have it, you're screwed. There's no way of your building a secure computer unless it's inside of a vault somewhere, and you have to remove admin rights. There are a few